I'd like to thank the organizers again for organizing a great conference so far. It's, it's been fun. Um, well, let's see. So I guess I guess Bob wanted me to um, <laughs> sort of clarify some things in my talk uh, yesterday or give an overview of it. Just summarize. Um, yeah, summarize it. Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, yeah, so the upshot, I guess, <clears throat> well, so most of the talk was spent just explaining what the, what the theorem, the terms in the theorem were, so, um, but, let's, so basically, uh, so we have these um, uh, reflection groups, which are arithmetic, <clears throat> And um, so you have you have some polyhedron, um, and this this estimate of El Safi and Ilias implies that um, if you had a lower bound on the first eigenvalue of this polyhedron, then um, you have this lambda one times volume. I guess lambda one I can write it to the m over two times volume of um, of the polyhedron would be less than or equal to the conformal volume, uh, the piecewise conformal volume of the polyhedron. Um, now, polyhedron hyperbolic space, um, well, hyperbolic space embeds into um, the two, well, into the N sphere as, say, the up, there's, a, there's a ball model, so it embeds in the upper half space. And this, this conformal volume then um, will be maximized, well, it'll, it'll be less than or equal to um, the conformal volume <coughs> of the um, of the n sphere. Well, this is, I mean, really in n dimensions here, um, which is equal to the volume of the n sphere, whatever that is. It's it's some constant that only depends on n. It it turns out well, if you have an n sphere, that the the conformal volume is exactly equal to its the volume of the n sphere. That's the best you can do. Um, so if we knew that there's a lower bound in the first eigenvalue of a polyhedron. Then um, that would imp we'd have this upper bound here on the conformal volume, and then the volume would be bounded. And by Wang's theorem, there'd be only finitely many um, reflection groups. Now the problem is that we don't necessarily have a lower bound in the first eigenvalue of a, re a maximal reflection group. Um, so, well, actually, this inequality here says that as as the volume of the polyhedron goes to infinity, um, the first eigenvalue so this part's bounded. So um, if, if the volume increases, then the first eigenvalue has to go to zero. But the problem is you might have some symmetry. Well, so we don't have a lower bound on this first eigenvalue. But when we quotient out by symmetries of this group, there might be like some rotation of a polygon um, that's, that's a symmetry of it. And there's a lower bound on the first eigenvalue of that quotient. So, um, so what we had to do is we had to work a little bit to get a, a lower bound on the, um, or sorry, an upper bound on the conformal volume of that quotient space um, using, well, so I didn't, I mean, I stated that as a lemma. I didn't explain how this uh, worked, but it's basically, you can sort of chop up the polyhedron into little pieces, and, um, well, it's, it's sort of, you, you, um, when you, when you r rotate here, you can just take a permutation representation. You can um, take this polyhedron um, and, um, well, not every, not every uh, finite group of rotations embeds in a reflection group. Uh, if you could do that, then you would just sort of, you would just put it inside a reflection group and the, the, the number of sheets will be bounded and so you could bound the conformal volume that way. But instead what we have to do is we, we put it in higher dimensions and permute it around and then quotient out um, by the action. So we sort of twist the representation to get a, a, a map into a higher dimensional orbifold and then that one um, does embed into in a reflection group. So um, just because it, it turns out to be permuting coordinates, if I if I take the the group of permutations of coordinates, that's a reflection group. It's just a sym symmetric group. And so and then you can bound. The the cool thing is that um, if I have a if I have a well, anyways, there's there's a way you can show there's a there's a bound on the number of pieces. Um, flat pieces that, so you get an isometric embedding and, and uh, in a hyperbolic 
uh, sorry, high dimensional uh, space. Um, and you can bound the conformal volume because you can bound the number of pieces that it's chopped up into. And each piece has bounded conformal volume um, because it's just flat. Um, so anyways, so th that's, so then, then we get some upper bound here and we can get a lower bound here and get some fineness results. So that's sort of a summary of what I was doing. But there's a lot of elements that go into it from number theory and things, but I love that. Does that help? <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, <clears throat> actually, before I started, I wanted to um, share an exciting discovery we made last night at the, at the bar. So, um, <laughs> we discovered a brand new model of, of hyperbolic space. Um, it's, oops, it's slightly slimmer than the Klein model. So the model is just an ellipse, the interior of an ellipse. And again, geodesics are just straight lines, like in the Klein model. So in honor of this conference, I decided that we should um, christen this, this new model the Calvin Klein model of hyperbolic space. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe I should take that off. So. <laughs> All right. You, you got to cut that out of the videos. <laughs> okay. Um, so <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about uh, again. This doesn't quite fit on the. Um, I wanted to talk about some applications of Kleinian groups to um, three manifold topology. Um, well. In the 70s, um, Thurston sort of revolutionized the study of three manifolds by uh, formulating his geometrization conjecture and proving it for a lot, large class of hyperbolic, uh, sorry, of, of three manifolds, proving that their um, Hawking manifolds are hyperbolic um, if they're atoroidal and irreducible. Um, and to, to prove this theorem, he used, he had to develop a lot of the theory of Kleinian groups. So um, Kleinian groups sort of used to mean finally generated uh, subgroups of isometries of hyperbolic three space, but which had um, a non-trivial uh, domain of discontinuity on the sphere at infinity. But it's sort of, the, the definition sort of broadened to include any finally generated subgroup of isometries of hyperbolic three space. Um, but classically, they, they referred to um, groups which had a non-trivial domain of discontinuity where you could do some complex analysis on that, um, on that domain. Well, um, so in the end, I guess, resolving the geometrization conjecture using Ricci flow um, by Hamilton and Perelman's work, um, really their, their solution doesn't really use much of, uh, or pretty much any of Thurston's ideas in improving the, the case for Hawking manifolds. But the techniques that he used to, to prove um, the geometrization of Hawking manifolds have been extremely influential on classifying um, the Kleinian groups which are, have infinite volume. So um, a, a closed manifold will have finite, finite volume, but um, he had to study the, the deformation theory and the structure of Kleinian groups of, um, of infinite volume. And he made some conjectures on these um, which have been resolved only recently. Um, and actually these these conjectures now, uh, or the classification of Kleinian groups has enabled us to understand certain aspects of the topology of, of closed or finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds. So I, I sort of wanted to um, describe some of these things um, today. So, um, so the, main, the main tool that we can apply is um, this uh, tameness of hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, which was conjectured by um, Marden in, in some form, or asked as a question by Marden, and then um, also, uh, I guess, also asked as a question by, by Thurston later um, <clears throat> after he had made some progress on this. So um, a three manifold is tame if and only if it's a compact, it's the interior of a compact three manifold boundary. So there's a compact three manifold with, with boundary C, and if we strip off its boundary, 
we get a man, a, an open manifold without boundary, and then that's isomorphic to M. Well, in, in three dimensions, you don't have these, this sort of phenomenon in higher dimensions of sort of weird compactifications and things. It's all pretty standard. This, this C can be triangulated or put a smooth structure on it nicely. Um, so this is equivalent to saying that um, there's a compact submanifold of M. It's actually the same C here uh, that embeds inside of M so that the complement is a product. So the ends of the, of the three manifold are, are products. That's equivalent to saying that it compactifies. <clears throat> so there's examples um, that uh, of this sort of the whitehead type of, of example that uh, of three manifolds that are non-compact with finely generated fundamental group, but the, the ends are not products. Well, um, because of that, um, you, you couldn't hope to prove that three manifolds with finely generated fundamental group have product ends because there's these counterexamples, but with a little extra assumptions, then um, you can you, you can prove this. So with um, so if we assume that the manifold is hyperbolic, or we can prove this in slightly more generality, um, if we assume that the, it's a complete Riemannian manifold with pinch negative curvature, so there's constants b and a less than zero such that the sectional curvatures are pinched between a and b. Um, so it's more curved than h squared a, but less curved than h squared b. And you can express these actually in terms of um, cat inequalities or Alexandrov inequalities, um, if you like, if you're more familiar with that. But um, anyways, if, if you don't like the pinch negative curvature, you can just think of uh, the hyperbolic case. Well, um, <clears throat> a cusp of M is a, is a region such that loops can be made arbitrarily short by a homotopy, um, and a manifold has hyperbolic cusps. A pinch negatively curved manifold um, will be interested in only, we have, to re, we have to make this assumption on the cusps for technical reasons. I don't think it's, um, it's actually an issue, but um, we assume that the, the cusps are locally isometric to H3. So a cusp in a non-compact manifold, well, you can have a, a torus cross with R like we've seen already, but um, you can also have an annulus, an infinite annulus, S1 cross R, cross with an infinite interval. So in the upper half space model of hyperbolic space, you see a, a horosphere, which is just a horizontal plane at some height, and then the region above that, and then quotient out by some translation. That's what, um, that's what a, a cusp will look like in a, in a general pinch negatively curved manifold. Uh, or, well, I mean, this is the assumption that we need to make. So, um, so the theorem then, uh, due to myself and independently Caligari and Gabay uh, a few years ago, is that um, if we have a three manifold with a pinch negatively curved metric and hyperbolic cusps, then the fundamental group, and the fundamental group is finally generated, then the manifold's tame. Um, so, So some remarks on this is that, um, well, first of all, by the assumption of pinch negative curvature, um, pi two is zero, because uh, it's universal cover is, is R three. Um, and <clears throat> also by the finally generated assumption, there's a, a theorem due to Scott and uh, independently Shalin from the 70s, um, the core theorem, which says that M is homotopy equivalent to a compact three manifold. And in fact, you have, you can embed a, a compact three manifold into M as a homotopy equivalence. This, this is the compact core of the manifold. It carries the fundamental group. The problem is that you don't know that the complement is, um, is a product. But it is, so there's, there's no obstruction to it being compactified um, if you know that it's homotopy equivalent to a compact manifold. So this is, this is quite a powerful theorem because, um, well, it, another way of saying this, well, this, this works in more general, this, this is for arbitrary manifolds with, um, with, with pi two equals zero um, and finally generated fundamental group and they're homotopy equivalent to a compact manifold. The pinch negative curvature is not assumed here. So, um, so this, this means that three manifold groups are coherent. If they're finally presented uh, sorry, finally generated, then they're finally presented. So a compact manifold, the fundamental group is finally presented. It has you know, only finitely many relations. So this is a very powerful property of, of groups. Um, 
And then, well, the finite generation is certainly necessary here uh, if the manifold is going to be tame. Um, but the converse is also true. So if M is irreducible and atoroidal and tame, then Thurston's geometrization theorem for Hawken manifolds, and let's assume the other characteristic is less than zero, then, um, then the manifold will have a hyperbolic metric. And it actually has a geometrically finite one. Um, so, and this is actually used in the proof of this tameness theorem um, in, in one of the steps. It's, uh, or it's, it's a useful, you can probably get around it, but it's, it's useful to, to know that. So, <clears throat> so in particular, um, by, the, by the core theorem, we know that um, M is homotopy equivalent to a compact manifold um, under, this, under these assumptions here before proving this theorem. We, we knew that. And we also know that this compact core, the interior, has a hyperbolic metric of finite volume because M is pinch negatively curved and some Ramanian geometry then implies that, well, M is irreducible because pi 2 is 0 and it's atoroidal as well. If you have a pinch negatively curved metric, then it's uh, atoroidal. So we know that the compact core actually looks hyperbolic, but we just have to prove that it compactifies the space. So theorem in two is a uh, Thurston? Or this is just a remark. Yeah, this, oh yeah, this is due to Thurston. The geometrization so theorem Hawken for Hawken manifolds. Because okay. here I was assuming that the only characteristic less than zero, so it, it's Hawken, yeah. I mean, this, for, for finite volume things, this theorem is, is trivial. So actually, because uh, that follows from Margulis' lemma. But yeah, that's. So um, a brief history. So, so today, then, I'm, so I'm going to outline um, some of this history of this tameness and then some of the consequences. I'm also going to mention this classification of, um, <coughs> of Kleinian groups. Um, so, but a, a brief history of this tameness conjecture. Martin proved this for geometrically finite hyperbolic manifolds. Um, so, and he conjectured this holds true for general hyperbolic free manifolds. So, a geometrically finite um, hyperbolic manifold is one that, um, this, which has a convex core of finite volume. Um, and so the whole issue here then is dealing with examples where the the convex core has infinite volume. Um, now, a group is indecomposable if it can't be written as a non-trivial free product. Um, now, Thurston proved that um, strong limits of geometrically finite hyperbolic manifolds with indecomposable fundamental group are tame. Now, um, I, I'm not going to be able to really describe what a strong limit is, um, but this is a key step in the proof of the geometrization conjecture. Well, I'll just say briefly. So, um, a strong limit in um, in geometry, there's this notion of gromov hausdorff convergence of, of, of metric spaces that's extremely important. And in inclining groups, it's, a, it's an important tool. So you can, you can look at a, at a geometric limit, a gromov hausdorff limit of a sequence of manifolds. But you can also look at um, an algebraic limit. So you just have, you have a, a group generated by finitely many elements. So you just have a, a finite collection of two by two matrices with complex coefficients. And if you have a sequence of these, you can just ask, well, do the, do the coefficients of these matrices converge? <laughs> and that's algebraic convergence. Well, you also want the, the groups to converge to something that's isomorphic. So you want the groups to all be isomorphic along the way with that set of generators. So that's basically what strong convergence is. Um, but he had, to, he had to assume this indecomposability condition which is a strong condition. It's satisfied, for example, for surface groups, um, which is basically gives you, um, so th this, this works whenever you have a, um, a manifold uh, whose compact core is incompressible, the boundary of the compact core is incompressible. That's basically um, the, what this, in, for the three manifold case, what this amounts to. Um, and then Bonohan uh, proved this well, but yeah, so the problem is here, though, that it doesn't hold for free groups, for example, and there is several applications of tameness that um, are really only work for free groups. And so there's some, um, there's, it was, there's some interest in trying to extend this to general free groups. Um, Bonahan then generalized Thurston's argument 
and proved it for arbitrary hyperbolic uh, manifolds um, with any composable fundamental group. So he, he proved this tameless conjecture in um, the 80s for, for a, a, hu a huge class of, of hyperbolic manifolds. Um, now, as I mentioned, there's the Scott core theorem, or the Scott and Schelling uh, theorem, um, that says there's a compact core that beds in M, which is homotopy equivalent to it under these assumptions. And Bonahan showed that the general case would reduce to the case you could assume that the compact core is a compression body. So this is equivalent to saying if, if you could prove it for manifolds whose fundamental group is a free product of surface groups and cyclic groups, so basically a free group and with some surface groups attached, then um, you would be able to prove it for general manifolds. Um, a compression body is when you, you take a surface and you thicken it up and you add a bunch of handles. It's a, one handles to it. So it's a generalization of a, um, of a handle body. But basically, if you can prove it for free groups, then you basically can prove it for anything. <coughs> so, um, Canary then generalized Bonahan's tameless result to the pinch negatively curved category. And um, this was this was not just a, an exercise to try to generalize it to an arbitrary metric. Um, I'll mention in a bit what, what else he proved um, that was important progress on this. Um, now, Thurston and Canary showed that um, this is in some sense a special case of this tameless conjecture. So if we have M, a hyperbolic manifold with infinite volume, um, and you take any cover of it that has finely generated fundamental group, M tilde, um, oh, I should have said finitely generated here. I didn't mean finite. Um, then M tilde is tame. So, um, uh, so here, oh, sorry. And I also should have said um, of infinite index. Um, okay. But basically, if you have a, if you have a, what this says is if you have a handle body or the interior of a handle body, and you take some infinite index um, covering space, then this manifold is also tame. So um, if, if you kept track of the boundary, what, what this looks like is, um, say we take the fundamental group corresponding to the, um, the, the left-hand side of this handle body here, then when we, when we look at its, its covering space, what we're going to see, if we kept, kept track of the boundary, what we see is, um, this manifold that has these ends that are sort of tree-like. And actually, the boundary of, um, of this manifold is actually just a genus 2 handle body with this Cantor set removed from the boundary. So it's a, a missing boundary manifold. You, um, you have a manifold with boundary, you remove some compact subset. In this case, it's just a, a standardly embedded Cantor set. Um, so actually, um, this is sort of a, a slightly stronger version of, of tameness. And this, is, this was an important uh, result. I mean, that we actually make um, the, the proofs of tameness make use of this result in, a, in an important way. Um, and it can also be proved for like candle bodies a little bit more combinatorially using a little bit of sort of just hands-on um, topology. Canary and Minsky generalized Thurston's theorem to prove that strong limits of tame manifolds are tame. So here we've eliminated the assumption of indecomposability that Thurston used. Um, Thurston was proving this for as a step in his proof of the geometrization conjecture for Hockin manifolds. Um, and then this was proved, generalized by various people, Evans, Oshika, and then eventually Brock and Soto showed that algebraic limits of tame hyperbolic manifolds are tame. So again, an algebraic limit, you just look at the convergence of the coefficients of the matrices. <coughs> so um, it's sort of a weaker condition. And there's um, results on tameness by many others. I was influenced principally by um, my advisor, Mike Friedman. So Friedman McMullen wrote a paper, but Friedman spent, um, all right, he, he spent a lot of time in his seminar thinking about this for um, when I was a student. Um, and um, so I learned a lot from him uh, about that was, that's useful in understanding this problem. Um, there's various other results by various conditions for tameness by Klein and Soto, 
Connell, uh, Cohen, Shalen, Longer Reed. There's, so there's a whole lot of, of work on this, or progress on this conjecture. But um, these other ones I've listed, to me, were more important because they were um, the techniques that, um, that, were, that were useful um, in, in understanding the problem. Uh, so, so now, um, let's see, actually, I was going to. Um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so I'll mention uh, a couple of applications here. So um, this isn't an application to studying closed manifolds, or as far as I know, it's, um, it doesn't really have an, uh, an application. Um, well, it, it, well it, it actually sort of does. I'll mention something a little bit later that's uh, related to this. Um, so there's Alfors measure conjecture was conjectured um, by Alfors in the 60s. Um, so if we take a Kleinian group, um, um, and we take omega of gamma to be its domain of discontinuity. So this is a subset of the sphere infinity of hyperbolic space, which um, where the group acts discontinuously. Um, and you can you can also see it as the complement of the limit set. Um, so the limit set again in the boundary of hyperbolic space um, is a complement of the domain discontinuity, but you can write the limit set as you take any point x in hyperbolic space and you look at its um, iterates under the group action and you take the closure just in the, in the ball model if you like um, and the, you look at the intersection of that closure with the boundary at infinity. Then um, that's the limit set and then the domain of discontinuity is in the complement. So it's, it's it, it, so here, it'll have, the group will have to act discontinuously because points aren't accumulating here. Um, so the classic example of this is a quasi-Fuchsian surface group. Um, so you can, you can take a, a surf, like a Fuchsian surface group and you can deform it. For example, you can take a geodesic and you can bend along a geodesic and you can get um, limit sets, which are these fractals, the house drift dimension is greater than one, and these are quasi-circles. Um, they're, well, I'm not going to define what that means, but anyways, there's, um, you get these nice fractals coming at the, the limit sets of, of Kleinian groups. <clears throat> now, what Alfred's conjecture was that either the limit set of the group is all of the sphere at infinity, or else the measure of the limit set is equal to zero. So, uh, so that's the Alfred's measure conjecture. Um, Alfred's also proved a finest theorem. So this was in, um, the conjecture was made in this paper in which he proved this finest theorem, which says that if we take the domain of discontinuity and mod out by the action of gamma, then um, we get a conformally finite Riemann surface. And um, the, the proof of, the proofs of tameness uh, that we have now are, give a purely geometric proof of this. So Alfred's proof was uh, more analytic, making use of um, some complex analysis of st study of these um, <clears throat> of these Riemann surfaces. Um, but now we get a, a purely geometric proof of the Alfors finest theorem. So here's a here's a picture of a of a limit set of a Kleinian group. So you get these. Nice fractal pictures. So Alfors, the the Alfors measure conjecture then means that, that the measure of this, um, the Lebesgue measure of it, of it is zero, <clears throat> um, and then the domain discontinuity is this colored stuff out here. So the the white stuff is just the limit set. Now um, the the way that tameness is related to this Alfors. So is that, is that well, this is just the limit set um, on the you know, on the plane. So yeah, you can take its convex. Yeah, you know, this is convex Kuchenbach. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I don't actually have a picture of one of these degenerate groups. That um, the degenerate groups actually. Um, so the ones that that, uh, that are not geometrically finite, their limit sets again. They have measure zero, but the Hausdorff dimension can be two. And so when you try to draw these things, they sort of tend to fill up 
the plane because you're putting little dots down and the house shift dimension is two and so it's going to just sort of become a, a big mess even though the measure is zero. Um, so, so the way that uh, this is proved um, was via this geometric tameness conjecture um, which is formulated by Thurston and proved by Thurston in the cases that I mentioned before, uh, strong limits of geometrically finite uh, manifolds within the composable fundamental group. So, uh, so the geometric tame is, is um, stronger than just saying that the end is a product. It has a geometric condition on this end. And um, this is extremely important. I mean, the, the, the way that you prove that, it's, that the end is a product is you actually prove this geometric tameness conjecture. So it's, it's an important conjecture for trying to, to prove this theorem because it's, sometimes it's easier to prove something much harder, right? Because it sort of focuses your mind on the important, or on, you know, the important aspect. So, um, so the end of a manifold will be, if it's tame, then it'll be homeomorphic to a surface cross an array, and um, that end is geometrically tame, or this is a neighborhood of the end looks like that, so the, the end is geometrically tame if this, either the end is geometrically finite, um, so this, like in this case here, if, if, if the manifold is geometrically finite, then the ends will be geometrically finite. Um, so in the geometrically finite case, one way of saying is that you can, you can take the convex core of the manifold, the convex core of the manifold is obtained by taking the limit set and taking its convex hull in hyperbolic space and then quotienting out by the action of the group. That gives you a canonical minimal convex core. You can take a little regular neighborhood if you want to get something um, that that's, um, has nicer boundary. The, the boundary of the convex core is, can be sort of bent quite a bit. But um, then if the end is geometrically finite, then you can compactify it by one of these Riemann surfaces coming from the domain of discontinuity. So this gives you this natural compactification, which is what uh, Marden observed. Um, but <coughs> so so in this in this in this geometrically finite picture, you have um, this convex core, and the boundary will be um, it will actually be a hyperbolic surface that's sort of been bent. It's bent along a lamination, and outside of here. Um, if you take a regular neighborhood of radius r, the, you get this family of surfaces that gives you a product um, structure out here, and um, where the areas of these surfaces grow exponentially as you, as you go away from there. So these things are sort of flaring out exponentially, um, and they're fairly well understood by the work of Marden. Well, um, Thurston realized that um, there's another model for what the ends of a hyperbolic manifold can look like. So you can just think about a surface group. Um, and this is uh, related to what Bob was mentioning the other day. That, um, so Thurston uh, discovered that if you, well, if you take a three manifold that fires over a circle, so there's a map to a circle um, where the preimages of the points are just a surface. So if we have a three manifold firing over a circle, if we take the infinite cyclic cover dual to this fibering, we're going to see a manifold that has this periodic structure. And in particular, um, well, this implies that the, the, manif the manifold, the convex core of the manifold would have infinite volume. Because you're taking something with finite volume here and you're unwrapping it, you know, infinitely many times. So this will have infinite volume here. And if you take, for example, a surface here, you'll see it sort of repeated periodically. Um, so so this, this clearly can't be geometrically finite so that you need some other sort of notion for what the ends look like here. And um, so an end then is simply degenerate um, if, and this, this was formulated by Thurston in, in a special case and generalized by Canary. So you have, you have this surface cross with an interval. Topologically it's tame, but it, more importantly um, for the geometry, you have a sequence of simple closed curves on this surface here which when you make the, the geodesic representatives, you pull them tight to be geodesic, they end up um, marching at the end. And you can pull them tight, you can homotope them to be geodesic in the complement of uh, the rest of the manifold. So only you, remaining entirely inside of this end. So, um, 
And once you have these geodesics of that form, you can, um, you can put through, the, there's this method of Thurston of pleated surfaces, which allows you to put surfaces um, going through that contain these geodesics. Because they're simple clothes, you can, you can put a surface um, through them that's homotopic in this end to this surface. So you can, you can find these surfaces that control the geometry of the end. And so this is precisely what you see in the case of a fiber manifold. So Thurston discovered this in trying to prove the geometrization conjecture for manifold, three manifolds at fiber of the circle, which is a special case of the geometrization of Hockham manifolds. So um, Thurston then conjectured that um, the ends of a hyperbolic manifold, so corresponding to a Kleinian group, are either geometrically finite or simply degenerate. So that's the geometric tameness conjecture. And this is actually what we proved. So, um, so actually, in the, well, the way you, you here, I assume that the end was already a product, but the way that tameness is proved, you actually first find these surfaces that sort of march out the end and have the right homological properties. They homologically separate the end. And then you can use some standard techniques to interpolate between pleated surfaces and, and, um, and then use some three manifold topology to prove that the end is a product. So that's, so actually there's, there's sort of an intermediate um, version of this simply degeneracy where you don't really have to assume it's a product, but you can conclude it's a product afterwards. And that's key to the proof of tannus. Um, so the, the surfaces that I'm talking about, so the, the key, there's some key uh, geometric input at various points of this theorem, obviously, because otherwise, um, I mean, because you can't prove that an arbitrary manifold um, has, has product ends. Um, and one of the key tools is, are these, which, so these simplicial world surfaces, um, these are sort of simpler to work with than pleated surfaces, which is what Thurston used. These simplicial world surfaces um, were introduced by Bonahan and his version of tameness for, for manifolds within a decomposable fundamental group. And what you do is um, you can take, um, you just take a, a map of a surface into a manifold. Let's assume, let's assume it's pi one injective for simplicity, um, but there's more general versions of this where you don't have to assume it's pi one injective. But anyways, um, and you take a triangulation of your surface. Now in a hyperbolic metric, if you have uh, any, um, any arc, it, it's uniquely homotopic to a geodesic. So that's one key way that hyperbolic or um, negative curvature is used. It, it, even in pinch negatively curved metric, the same is true. And if it's actually hyperbolic, I can then take any triangle, I can keep the endpoints fixed, I can homotope the edges to be geodesics. And if it's, if it's hyperbolic, then I can fill in that triangle with a, with a geodesic triangle. In the pinch negative curve category, all you do is you just, you just cone off one vertex to the opposite edge. And that turns out to be um, a nice enough triangle to work with. Um, now, well, when you do this, you, you might have a surface which naturally wants to live over here, but your vertices are over here. So when you cone it off, you sort of get this cone point near the vertex. But you can actually push the vertices back to where the surface is and you can, you can arrange it, like one way to arrange it is if you take a one vertex triangulation like for this octagon here, I can just first make one of these edges, it forms a closed loop in the manifold. So I can first homotope that to be uh, a geodesic loop. And then um, through the vertex you'll see a, a geodesic arc going through. And so when I connect up the other two sides, I'm going to get a cone angle that's greater than or equal to 2 pi there. And that implies that you get a cat minus one met intrinsic cat minus one metric on this surface. And so that's, this is one of the key tools that was introduced by Thurston and developed by Bonahon and Canary um, to study, to control the, these ends here. So, um, so this is actually how, given one of these loops here in the simply degenerate case, how you put a surface that goes through it. You put one of these pleated surfaces through it. And because um, because you have this cat minus one metric here, um, if, if you have a, if you have a, well, and because of the Margulis lemma, um, let's assume, let's assume there's, that the injectivity radius is bounded at this end, like it would be in this case. Well, if you have a, if you have a surface that's pi one injective and the injectivity radius, radius is bounded from below, 
then um, there's a simple co-area argument which says that the diameter of the surface is going to be bounded. So you can just, you can just um, think of taking um, a point and taking the distance function from there and it's going to, if the, um, as you sweep out through the surface, the, um, well, if the area is bounded, then the, um, then you can show that, that the diameter is, the diameter has to be bounded as well. In the cap minus one metric, otherwise you would, um, because of the injectivity rays assumption, the area would grow sort of exponentially with the diameter, and that would give you a, a contradiction. Or, well, it's, well, anyways, there's, there's a simple argument. Um, it's one of these systolic inequalities, basically, that, um, that bounds the diameter if you, in terms of the area. <clears throat> um, now, there's a way to move, once I have these, these nice simplicial rolled surfaces, there's a way to move between them by modifying my triangulation. But um, in the Pensionagulie curve category, you sort of have to work a little more coarsely, but you can, um, you can work with the pants decomposition. So you can first make, take some geodesics on the surface and extend it to a triangulation. Now, if I take a maximal collection of disjoint um, curves on a surface, there is a way to um, change one curve into a, into a curve that's not too far from it, just by t removing it and replacing it with a curve that intersects it, um, that intersects it in only two points, or um, that intersects it in one point if, the, when you remove it, you get a, a, a punctured torus. Um, so there's this, there's this pants decomposition, and there's a pants complex, which is um, connected by these, these sequences of moves. And so you can, and you can show that when you, when you do this modification of the surface, um, that you, um, you can, that the, the, the surface that will not move that far, and um, you, can, you, can bound, you can control to some extent how, um, how much the surface changes when you do that. So what you can do is you can take one of these simplicial rolled surfaces here with one geodesic and take another geodesic and you can, you can um, march through this pants, well extend that to a pants decomposition and march through this pants complex to make this surface homotope over this surface at each stage keeping the area controlled. Um, so this is another key way that negative curvature comes in. And so these surfaces that march out the end, you can bring them back by, um, by marching by changing the triangulation and homotoping them back, keeping the area bounded. And because the area is bounded, the diameter is bounded, so this homotopy is not going to like sweep through the manifold and then come back here. It's going to sort of monotonically, roughly monotonically move along because the, the diameter is bounded. So all these surfaces, so even if this end wasn't a product, if you have these surfaces which homologically separate out here, then you can, you can homotope them back, keeping their, um, their geometry controlled, and then um, there's a way of taking these immersed surfaces and creating an embedded surface that has the same genus due to, to Gavai. It's sort of a generalization of the loop theorem or the sphere theorem um, to higher genus surfaces that are homologically non-trivial. So then you can, um, you can prove then that if you have a region that's bounded by surfaces of some genus and I can homotope a surface through there, then um, then that region actually has to be a product region. So this uses the JSJ decomposition, the annulus theorem, and various things. So there's, um, so there's a common, there's an interplay between the geometry and the topology to, to prove that these ends are tame. Once you have these surfaces going out, there's some push and roll and have bounded genus and which are homotopy equivalent to each other. So the hard part then for tameness is proving the existence of these surfaces that, um, that go out the end. <coughs> Um, let's see, so, <clears throat> so, um, I'll mention in a sec some more of what goes into this, um, the proof of this theorem that, uh, I wanted to mention some more of the history. Uh, Bonahan and Thurston show that if M is hyperbolic and pi 1M is indecomposable, then M is geometrically tame. So, as I mentioned before, um, Thurston introduced this notion of geomet geometric tameness and proved it for large classic groups. But Bonahan's theorem, I said Bonahan proved that 
manifolds with indecomposable fundamental group are tame, but he actually proved they're geometrically tame. And then Canary showed that if you have a tame manifold that's also hyperbolic, then it's geometrically tame. So he proved that if you have tame manifold, then it's geometrically tame, and then geometric tameness implies the Alfors measure conjecture. So this was basically due to Thurston, uh, and then Canary generalized this to show that geometric tameness implies the Alfors measure conjecture. So, um, and the, the, the proof of this is actually based on the, the proof of Alfors of the analog of the measure conjecture in the two-dimensional case. So Alfors proved that if you have a Fuchsian group, that its limit set has measure zero. And his, his proof makes use of harmonic maps and various things, um, or harmonic functions. And um, Thurston realized that his proof would carry over to the three-dimensional case if you had uh, this geometric tameness condition. Um, so that's, that's sort of this history of this Alfors measure conjecture. Now, uh, the ending lamination conjecture was formulated by Thurston and also came out of his study of Kleinian groups um, to prove the geometrization. Um, this, this says that roughly that if M is hyperbolic and it's tame, then um, it's determined by, um, up to isometry, by its homeomorphism type and certain end invariants. So the end invariants are the conformal type of the geometrically finite ends, and the, there's certain ending laminations associated to the simply degenerate ends. Now, the ending lamination, um, <coughs> in the, if you have a simply degenerate end, you, um, you have this sequence of closed geodesics here that can be homotope further and further out the end. Now you can, you can think of these simple closed curves on the surface as um, you can fix some metric on the surface and they're going to sort of march around and they're going to limit in uh, say a gromov hausdorff sense to uh, lamination on the surface and that's the ending lamination uh, associated to this end. So Thurston said then, conjectured that th this um, any lamination for each simply degenerate end plus the conformal type of the geometrically finite end and the homeomorphism type of the manifold determine the Kleinian group. So this was proven um, by Brock, Canary, and Minsky recently, a couple years ago. Um, also, Mazur uh, had a lot of, uh, of um, work with Minsky that was important in that. Um, now, this implied the density conjecture, which was due to Bears and Thurston, which said that if you have any hyperbolic manifold with finite generated fundamental groups. So any Kleinian group is a limit of geometrically finite Kleinian groups. Um, and this was, due, this came as a corollary of the ending lamination conjecture plus work of many others, Klein and Sudo, Shika, Brock and Bromberg and Matsi, and there's various new versions of proofs of this now that make use of the ending lamination conjecture. And this, um, this, I mean this is a quite powerful then classification of Kleinian groups. They're all, you have the set of all Kleinian groups and their limits of these geometrically finite ones, which are sort of the more controlled ones. Um, so it's a, it's a powerful classification. And I actually, um, one of my applications I wanted to mention actually makes use of this density conjecture. Um, but, so uh, I just wanted to mention that some of the elements of the proof of the tameness, um, the first thing you do is you take what Friedman called a Tucker loop, um, I guess because Tom Tucker studied th these things. So you take um, an element of the fundamental group of the manifold which is not homotopic into any free factor. So here we're sort of concerned with the case where pi 1 of m is, free, is freely decomposable. It's a non-trivial free product. So you can just assume really it's a free group. Um, so we can take um, say, um, an element of the um, <coughs> commutator subgroup that um, it's sort of, or like, like you can take, if it's a free group, you can just take the, um, the relations that you have with the surface group, something like that. Um, or you can take the product of the squares of the generators. There's various choices. Um, <coughs> so then you can, so actually Canary chose, um, Canary was, uh, one that um, they also use this sort of uh, this sort of loop here, um, and then you homotope it to a geodesic. Um, and now the 
one of the key topological inputs that we use is uh, to use an N reduction, um, which is a notion introduced by Brennan Thickston. Um, so we take an N reduction at alpha star, so this geodesic. Um, the N reduction um, is a bit complicated to describe, but basically you exhaust the manifold by compact subsets outside of this alpha star. And then you, um, you take these compact subsets and you compress them as much as possible outside of the loop. So, um, and you can do this, once you've compressed one stage, you can make the next compressions in the complement of the previous stages. Um, and the limit, you, um, you end up, ex you, don't, you don't necessarily exhaust the manifold by this end reduction. It could be some not very well um, embedded, not a properly embedded submanifold. The, you end up getting the union becomes an open submanifold. You can actually prove, Friedman showed actually that you can get this end reduction to be the complement of some lamination with um, lamination by planes. Uh, but anyways, they come, these laminations come from the compressions, these disks that you use to compress. Now, um, so this is sort of a technical tool, and, and Bob Myers proved, Robert Myers proved a, a, a key, um, some key facts about these M reductions. So it turns out that if, if alpha star is, satisfies this property, this N reduction will actually contain a Scott core. So even though it's sort of nastily embedded, it still carries all of the fundamental group information in the manifold. And that was sort of key um, for, for this argument. And now, uh, the, the way that, that I, so Caner, uh, Caligari and um, Gabay use the same elements here. Um, we sort of diverged a little bit at this point. So what I did is take branch covers over this geodesic. Um, you can assume the geodesic is embedded by a little perturbation trick, but um, then you can, you can construct um, branch covers for which the Scott core that lies inside this end reduction lifts. And, um, and there's s some tricks to, you, to prove that it's tame um, that come from the work of Canary. So Canary introduced this branch covering trick. When you branch cover over geodesic, you have nothing, something that's no longer hyperbolic, but it's pinched negatively curved. Um, there's, a, there's a way to branch cover keeping things negatively curved, which is why Canary um, was interested in studying tameness and negatively curved manifolds. And then um, now you have this branch cover which contains a Scott core and which is tame, and so you can take a cover of it corresponding to the Scott core. Now covers of tame things are tame. This is this theorem of Canary and Thurston that I mentioned earlier. And so you, and then um, you can prove that this branch cover then is, um, you get this branch covering space which is homotopy equivalent to the manifold you started with. And um, this is actually where you can produce these surfaces that march out the end is via this branch covering, this sequence of branch covering tricks. Um, and then you use the pleated and simplicial root surfaces, this interpolation business to, to show the end is tame. So that's sort of an outline of the argument. But, um, but this, right after uh, these uh, two proofs appeared, the, the, they were simplified quite a bit by um, Choi and Sakuma and Bodich. So there's various versions of this proof now which are simpler than the original ones. Um, okay, well, so, so that was sort of a, an outline of the tameness argument. Now the applications to three manifolds, in the, the most important applications in, in my view, I guess, were um, Canary's covering theorem. Um, there's a version that was due to Thurston. Um, so let's see, maybe, I'll, maybe I won't state this in full generality, but I'll state it like this. So if we have a compact manifold and it has a subgroup which is geometrically infinite, then um, the only way that subgroup can be geometrically infinite if it's associated to a fibering of a finite sheet of covering of M over the circle. So when you have this picture I had before, if you have a manifold that fibers over a circle, um, so, so I have this manifold N, this compact manifold N, and it's, if, it, this geometrically, if there's a subgroup that's geometrically infinite, then it has to be um, associated to a surface um, that's um, dual to a fibering of a finite sheet of covering of N. So this is an extremely powerful theorem. So it says that it has this dichotomy, either a subgroup is geometrically finite or it's associated to one of these virtual fiberings. So conjugate into the Right, yeah, it's conjugate to this, yeah, to this fiber group. There's also a sort of twisted version. It's not, you can have a fibering over a mirrored interval, but it's, 
up to index two, it's it's associated to a five ring. Um, so, um, okay, so the so this this has some applications. This is actually so when when I was a graduate student, Friedman was working on his tameness conjecture, and I sort of learned a little bit about it, but I wasn't that interested in it. But when I tried to prove various things about volumes of hyperbolic manifolds or various other things, I kept running up against this conjecture. Um, so one of the reasons, um, so Kohler, Shale, and Hersonsky proved that, um, well, this is before, this, so this was, um, th this actually has some generalizations, but th they proved that the minimal volume orientable hyperbolic free manifold has a finite index cover, which has two generated fundamental group. Um, and as, as I mentioned the other day, the Weeks manifold is now known to be the minimal volume, but they proved this without using any computation or anything. Um, and there's, they, there's a large amount of generalizations of this um, that, they've, that they now have. Um, so this was one of my motivations originally for studying the Tannis conjecture was some of these applications to study of volumes of three manifolds and various other questions. Um, I guess we'll skip over this. Some other applications uh, to, to three manifolds. Um, you can prove that the generalized word problem is solvable for compact three manifold, which satisfies the geometrization conjecture. Again, that's not really an assumption anymore due to Perelman. And um, so the generalized word problem is if you're given a finite collection of elements in a group, and you're given a, a, another element in the group, is G contained in the subgroup generated by G1 through GN? Um, so that was something that far proved in his thesis that um, now follows from this, um, this, this fact here and um, the geometrization conjecture. Kapovich and Weidman proved um, that the rank is computable for Kleinian groups. So um, if you're given a, one of these hyperbolic manifolds, you can determine how many generators that you need to generate the fundamental group. Um, <clears throat> another corollary is um, due to uh, Wise and independently myself, Wong and Reed, um, is that the fundamental group of the figure eight knot complement is LERF, locally extended residually finite. So a, a group is, is LERF if you have finitely generated subgroups are the intersection of finite index subgroups which contain them. So LERF is a very powerful version in, or generalization of residual finiteness. And um, the, well, the residual finiteness is equivalent to saying that the identity, or the, the trivial subgroup is the intersection of finite index subgroups which contain it. So this is a, a more powerful generalization. But basically, we prove this for geometrically finite subgroups, but then due to this dichotomy here of geometrically finite versus um, virtually fibered, well, virtually fibered groups are, um, they are, uh, they do satisfy this property. They're intersection of finite subgroups which, which contain them because you first take this finite subgroup here, and then you just take cyclic covers dual to this. And in the, in the end, you, the intersection of these groups is just going to give you the surface group. So there's a very, this, so this argument was due to Thurston, so that LERF is very easy to see for geometrically infinite subgroups then. But you need this dichotomy here then. Um, and there's some other examples that are also LERF. There's fundamental group, there's Cypher Weber dodecahedral space, the Bianchi groups that I mentioned the other day, various other examples. Um, there's a conjecture of Simon, which is that co covers of compact, irreducible, three manifolds with finely generated fundamental group are tame. And um, so the corollary of tameness for hyperbolic manifolds is that Simon's conjecture holds for all three manifolds satisfying the geometrization conjecture. Um, and again, that's now known by Perelman. So um, Simon basically proved most cases of this assuming that you could prove it for the hyperbolic case, and um, Wong and Reed um, made some observations to how to generalize it to the general case. So basically, you, if you have a manifold that has a non-trivial geometric decomposition, you can use the tameness of the hyperbolic pieces and the cipher fire pieces and sort of glue them together to get tameness of the, of the, entire, um, the entire cover of, of your manifold. Um, 
This is a problem that was proposed by Jaco in Kirby's problem list. Okay, well, let's see. I guess I had a couple other applications, but um, uh, I'm about out of time here, so um, I'll, I'll just stop there. So.